My name is Marsha Tatarunga, and I am the dean. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I'll pay you uh, tomorrow. <laughs> I am the Dean of Evergreen State College, Tacoma. It's just my honor to see people in the building today. I'd like to begin by inviting our own president, Dr. John Carmichael, to come and give a welcome. So I've been invited to give a brief welcome, and I'll keep it brief. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered tonight on the ancestral lands of the Puyallup Nation. So let us begin tonight by acknowledging and honoring the Puyallup people and the indigenous people of the Coast Salish tribes and the indigenous people of all nations. As president tonight, it's, it's my role to welcome you with some humility to a land that's not my land and with similar humility to uh, welcome you to Evergreen's Tacoma campus. The true pillars of the Tacoma program are here in spirit or body. We're in the MIMS Hardeman Lyceum Hall, Dr. Mims, who raised the roof through her vision and labor, and Dr. Hardeman, who put down the roots that keep us here. And we can remember others, Dr. Young and Dr. Tyrus Smith, and now Dr. and Dean Marsha Tatarunga. The Tacoma campus at its best is Evergreen at its best. At Evergreen, we do not measure our worth by the number of students we reject. At Evergreen, we recognize that students come to us not as blank slates. They come to us with knowledge and experience. We know that that knowledge and experience is drawn from the communities that our students come from. And if we're gonna serve our communities, we need to learn from them. At Evergreen, we learn from our students even as we teach them. And at Evergreen, we know that what we teach has value when it can be put into practice in our neighborhoods and families. I don't know of any place in the nation that does this better than Evergreen Tacoma, and I don't know of anyone who has devoted more of their life to connecting higher education institutions to the communities they serve than Dr. Dexter Gordon, whom we're here to honor tonight. He and I are working in partnership now to lead Evergreen as the college evolves to better serve the communities that support us. So thank you all for being here tonight to welcome Dr. Dexter Gordon to Evergreen. Yes. Thank, you. thank you, President Carmichael, and we are happy you are here, and we are thankful for that welcome. We are very happy and honored that he is our president and that he has ushered in Dr. Gordon so well. So we thought about what would it look like to have someone from where Dr. Gordon is leaving. We call them the departing, the departing colleagues. And we have asked uh, Dr. Grace Livingston to please come and to share who Dr. Gordon was at UPS as he departs. Mm -hmm. Dr. Livingston. Good evening, everybody. It is, it is good to be back again in the Evergreen Tacoma space. I am thankful for the opportunity to speak in the name of Dr. Dexter Gordon and on behalf of my colleagues, specifically in African American Studies and the Race and Pedagogy Institute at the University of Puget Sound. My name is Grace Livingston, and I work in African American Studies and the Race and Pedagogy Institute, and have taught in the, the School of Education to Future Teachers in the foundations programs, in, in, in the foundation courses, and have worked across theater arts in directing and course creation and performance. If you would allow me, please, as part of speaking some words in the name of uh, honoring Dr. Dexter Gordon, I'd like to also mark the presence of my colleagues in African American Studies and the Race and Pedagogy Institute who are here. Professor Dr. Renee Sims, please. Part of the 
the race and pedagogy leadership team, I want to ask Dr. Jonathan Stockdale to stand for me. Uh, thank you very much for being here. And I'm going to call these people from University of Puget Sound. I want to mark the presence of Vivi Wen, Director of Intercultural Engagement. I want to ask Rachel DeMotz to stand, please. <laughs> Director of Environmental Policy and Decision Making. And Dr. Lisa Kessel, Professor of Politics and Government. Thank you so much for giving me company up here because I don't speak only for myself. I speak as part of a broader collective. In her essay entitled, No Humans Involved, an open letter to my colleagues, written in the wake of the 1992 not guilty verdict of the white police officers who beat Rodney King, Sylvia Winter, professor of black studies and head of black studies then, called to task not only the, the judicial system, and rightly so, she called to task not only the carceral system, and rightly so, she called to task not only the system of policing, and very rightly so, she called to task those she called the grammarians of the order. Those who set the systems and the logics that produce the conditions under which the LAPD could create a category called no humans involved to mark the lives of particularly young black and brown men caught in the judicial system. Winter said that we are the grammarians of the order, so she let loose on us in that letter. She said we are responsible for creating the techniques of ordering the facts that produce the death and the dehumanization in the ways that we produce orders of knowledge. She said we are as guilty as those systems because we are the grammarians. And we must do something about that. We created NHI. 1992, that verdict. It feels as if we are still in that season. 2012, 2013, count with me, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. I, I just chose to mark 2012 as the death of Trayvon Martin. It's as if this letter wasn't written in 1992, but in 2012, and still resonating until 2021. Professor Sylvia Winter was speaking to the work of Professor Dr. Dexter Gordon, Director and Professor of African American Studies 2002 to 2000 and 21, director of RPI, founder 2002 to 2021, now executive vice president of Evergreen State College. <laughs> Dr. Dexter Gordon has invested in grammar changing and order changing work at layered levels at the University of Puget Sound and beyond. Professor Mark McPhail, who reviewed Professor Dexter Gordon's Black Identity, Rhetoric, Ideology, and 19th Century Black Nationalism, not only called the book remarkable, Mark McPhail called the book a blueprint, a roadmap. Those are terms that can describe the depth of the grammar-changing work that Dr. Dexter Gordon has done at the University of Puget Sound. When you go after grammars, especially material grammars, historical grammars, social grammars, those are so deeply embedded in the social order, you have to know that you have to be everywhere at the same time. 
you have to be working at multiple levels. In the founding of the, of the, of the first courses dedicated to the minor in African American studies, Dr. Dexter Gordon led us and processed, and we processed together what we have come to call the infusion model for, for building African American studies. An infusion model means that you're outside and in at the same time. You're in the core, curricularly speaking, and you're building your courses at the same time. So what we have in Dr. Dexter Gordon is someone who knows how to listen to the present and the long term, how to listen to the past, how to listen to the, the local and the national. What we have in Dr. Gordon is a large thinker who thinks with the present that is in front of him. Dr. Gordon's work enacted what black feminist scholars have always named, as Patricia Hill Collins talks about the need of to understand the position of the outsider within. That infusion practice that is always paying attention to the ways in which you have to be here and there. On the run and standing steady. That's Dr. Dexter Gordon. We thank him for the pulse of infusion in the building of African American studies and especially establishing the minor at Puget Sound. When you're going after the foundations, when you're going after grammar work, when you're going after rules, you have to go after the foundations. You have, that's where you have to go. And so Dr. Gordon went to the foundations of African American studies. They say, you don't get to be only in the academy. That's not the, that's not the play of the hand. You have to be in the academy, in the educational system, and also without at the same time. What we call rigorous scholarship and responsible community engagement. That foundation was the foundation of the building of, and I'm looking right here, right here, right here, the first voice, Dr. Joy Hardman. And don't, don't try me on the name, on the date. December 21, 2005, in the Diversions, near that Diversions Cafe at Puget Sound, you were there when the Community Partners Forum formed. And I'm looking at forum members here. Rigorous scholarship, responsible engagement. And this is not responsibility, managerial responsibility. This is responsibility, historical accountability. Dr. Gordon understood that systems of higher education owe a debt to communities from whom they have stolen, they have benevolently borrowed, and not called it appro appropriation. Right. Communities that have allowed these universities to, to sit in places, these higher education institutions, these post-secondary institutions to sit in places where so much of the time the people who come to those places do not resemble the people who live in those places. That Community Partners Forum formed and that foundation that is African American studies, rigorous, rigorous scholarship, accountable, responsible community engagement. So he has left with us that pulse of that dual understanding of African American studies. And I'm getting close to closing. He left us, he's, he's, he's left with us a legacy of the practice of courage. Mm. Courage in the everyday, courage in the interstices of the work, courage on the, on, not only in the shaping of conferences that many of you know about 2006, 2010, 2014, 2018, not only on the big platforms, but what it means to do that work in the interstices of the everyday where nobody can see what the heartache looks like, 
what the heartbreak looks like, what the pressure looks like, what the trenches look like. Executive Vice President Dr. Dexter Gordon knows how to live in the trenches and knows how to keep getting back up. He's a model of that. Dr. Gordon, we congratulate you at this transition for you and this movement for you and also for us because Evergreen, the Evergreen State College is a part of, uh, is a part of us, is a part of community. We thank you for being gritty, for being generative, for being sig signature and for being searing. We thank you for leaving us with the groundwork to reimagine something that's different from this no humans involved. Logic of death and dehumanization, of, avo of avoiding and deflecting. We thank you for your legacy and for your sacrifice. Thank you so much. Thank you for also bringing your colleagues and acknowledging them in the room. We welcome you from UPS. We are so glad you are here. We, it is time that we have uh, dialogue and friendship together. We are serving the same people in the same community. And so we, we welcome you and we look forward to a long and rewarding relationship. So thank you very much. We have come to see through your eyes that Dr. Gordon was very cherished at UPS and that his work it precedes him and also that we are so fortunate to have him with us now. So with that, we thought of also a person who is receiving, a colleague receiving Dr. Gordon here at Evergreen. And we'd like to welcome to the podium our Vice President for Inclusion and Excellent Student Success, uh, Dr. Therese Saliba. Thank you so much. Thank you to the community. Thank you, Dr. Livingston. Thank you for gifting us with your words. I was able to attend the Race and Pedagogy Conference in 2018. It was an incredibly transformative event, and I can see the power of the work that Dr. Gordon and you all, it's nice to meet the community behind that work and to recognize all of you um, for the work you're doing to transform these systems and these grammars and to work deeply for change. I'd also like to thank Dr. Tatarunga, um, our Division of Inclusive Excellence and Student Success at Evergreen has treasured our deep connection to Evergreen Tacoma, to Dr. Hardiman, um, Dr. Mims, uh, Dr. Gilda Shepard, and um, all of those here who've been a shining light for equity, racial justice, social justice, and community connection and service. From our collaborative celebrations on Juneteenth to all kinds of rich programming, we in Olympia draw inspiration, energy, and creative partnership from our sister campus and colleagues in Tacoma. So thank you for hosting this event, to welcome Dr. Dexter Gordon, with the warm fire of Evergreen Tacoma Hospitality. We at Evergreen are truly excited to receive Dr. Dexter Gordon. He will be leading our Division of Inclusive Excellence and Student Success. Um, Dean Coley Gladney is with me here tonight, as well as our Marketing and Communications Office, which is um, Farah Hayes and Kelly Van Holtz 
Gore sitting over here. We look forward to getting to know him as well as you all do and how um, beautifully you spoke of his many great attributes. So far, after 40 some days, we know that Dr. Gordon exudes um, a depth of commitment and experience to racial equity, justice. As the celebrated founder of the Race and Pedagogy Institute and Chair of African American Studies at UPS, in a short time already, he's impacted us with his storytelling. He's held our concerns with careful listening and guided us through some troubled waters with wisdom and strategic insight. He brings new energy to Evergreen, a renewed commitment to the ongoing struggle for equity and racial justice in our communities, recognizing that student access and success in higher ed is key to our collective liberation. Or as Bell Hooks says, education is the practice of freedom. Through his leadership, Dr. Gordon is reigniting in Evergreen a spirit of community connection, collective care, and hope. We're so pleased to receive you, Dr. Gordon, to welcome you at a challenging time, but one with, that is ripe with opportunity. Please know we are here to support you in your leadership. In Arabic, we say, Ahlam wa sahlan wa salam alaykum. Peace to you and your people. Welcome to the Evergreen family, Dr. Gordon. Thank you so much, Therese. Um, really happy to have you represent the Evergreen side of, our, uh, of Dr. Gordon's uh, journey and that you are welcoming him on this journey. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to hear now from a very special person. Today is your day, Dr. Gordon. We, we have heard from the colleagues you left, how dear you were to them and how important you have been to this region. You have done your service as a community person above and beyond that of educator um, at UPS. We are anxiously and, and incredibly awaiting your work that will unfold in time, and we will be so grateful to have received um, you in good time. And so at this time, we'd like to offer you this moment to give a few words. And I'm not even going to um, ask you to keep it five minutes. <laughs> But uh, we do believe that you have something to say on this grand day. So welcome. Thank you. I want to make sure that Dr. Tate Aronga and I are on the same page. Because you said five minutes just now, uh, the communication said 12. Any, any, anybody who was, who was heard this Baptist preacher speak know that I don't readily yield back my time. I'm honored to be here with you today. I'm honored because I know from whence I've come. I'm honored because I know who brought me here. I'm honored because when I walk, I walk on shoulders. Shoulders that refuse to yield. And in so doing, created for me stepping stones. I come here from the shores of the Caribbean island of Jamaica, Old Harbor Bay. Identified as the largest fishing village 
in the country. I come here from being reared by people who lived outside of and often below the formal structures. My own parents, their education ended at age 15. Their formal education ended at age 15. And I was encouraged to listen recently and hear that Pauli Murray almost had her education end at age 15. Who is Pauli Murray? I was shocked. I had used Pauli Murray's work 20 years ago because she wrote about the Caribbean diaspora living in New York. It is only now I am finding out that Pauli Murray was able to go to Howard Law School because Thurgood Marshall paid for her to go. I'm only finding out now that Pauli Murray wanted to go to one of the elite colleges on the East Coast in 1926, the same year that Zora Neale Hurston entered that college. Zora Neale Hurston was 34. And Zora Neale Hurston got in, Polly Murray did not. Zora Neale Hurston got in because she was 34, an established writer by that time, and someone else paid for her to get in. I was stunned to find out that it was Zora Neale, it was Pauli Murray who said to Thurgood Marshall, you ought to give up on the effort to gain equal uh, support for black classrooms and litigate this issue as an infraction of the 14th Amendment. That was how we got Brown versus Board of Education. I was surprised to find out that Polly Murray said to Betty Friedan, let's start an NAACP for women. And Betty Friedan named it now. I was surprised to find out that Polly Murray shared with um, blanking on, on um, his name, I'll, I'll, James Baldwin, shared with James Baldwin a writer's retreat, both of them writing together. And Polly Murray was a community activist, a legal scholar, and an Episcopal priest. When I listen to the story of Polly Murray, I think about my mother, the story is that she was the best in her class. Both in terms of her athletic prowess and in terms of her intellectual ability. I've spent, my mother died 
51 years now. And I've spent the last 51 years trying to understand the woman I now consider to be a genius. Ran a household raising 14 children. Guided women to earn and save their money. These were women who lived outside of the banking system. My mother was the banker. A woman who provided men their starting opportunity, whether it was my uncle or one of her friends, she would provide them with the money to start their fishing business. And she did all of that sitting on her step at home. I think about that experience and I think about what education does to our children. I met Evergreen not inside even this August building. I met Evergreen in community, Maxine Mims, retrieving from the dust heap to which our education system consigned our black and brown children, especially boys and girls, consigned them so that they were not in classes anymore. They were being disciplined. And that discipline moved them out of the track of instruction and set them on a path to failure. That's where I met Maxine Mims. My colleague Grace Livingston told you about where Joy Hardiman showed up. Grace and I were brand new and we invited the community to have a conversation with us about possibilities for our work. This was 2005. And the community said to us, we gathered there, I think we had about 29 mainly African-American folk. And they said to us, are you sure so many black people can gather on this campus? They went further. They said, who are you? Did the institution send you to pimp us? I, I don't know that language. I am quoting verbatim from our meeting. <laughs> Did they send you to pimp us? In that first meeting, December 21, 2005. Joy Hardman stood up. She had known us maybe for weeks. And Joy Hardman said to the people in the room, I know these people. They are good people. You should support their work. That was the formal beginning of our Community Partners Forum. That's where I met Evergreen, in the cut and thrust of the work for justice. I met Evergreen in the work of R.T. Young. The legislature wanted to pass a bill they called the Gangs Bill. Remember it, 2011? The New Jim Crow had just come out. And we in the conversation had just studied it. And we found out about this gangs bill, which was going to criminalize our young men, especially our young black boys. And we decided we needed to mobilize our community. R.T. Young said, this is a space. This is a space for those conversations. We invited the 
then uh, legal authority in the city of Tacoma. And he said to us, he wasn't sure he could gather with so many people. And so we argued and said he was a public servant and should come and talk to us about the legal ramifications of this bill. And the compromise we got was that he would come in through that door, come up these stairs, we were on this platform, and he would speak for seven minutes and then he would leave. That was the prosecutor. Because, because he did not want to face our community's questions. That's the context in which I met Evergreen. I met Evergreen when I went to the Purdy prison. It's the Gig Harbor prison, but Gig Harbor people don't like when you <laughs> call it that. That's where, through Laurie Arnold, I found out Gilda Shepherd was working among the women of this prison. That's where I met Evergreen. I met Evergreen when we assembled people from this region who would meet every Sunday. We've done it now for 15 years. What did we want to do? We wanted to engage every issue our society said we should not engage. We wanted to discuss race. We wanted to discuss politics. We wanted to discuss religion. We wanted to discuss gender issues. We wanted to discuss justice as a way of advancing our lives in community. That's where I met Evergreen. That's where I met Alton McKenzie. McKenzie, Alton McDonald. That's where I met Patricia. That's where I met Eve. I don't, Eve was not Evergreen, but you may as well be, because your, your daughters are. <laughs> That's where, that's where I met Mona Baghdadi, in community. And that's why I am thrilled to be part of this family. I am thrilled to be part of the Evergreen family. Gilda Shepherd looked at me in 2010 and said to me, you know, we're looking for leadership over at Evergreen. Uh, you should come on over. <laughs> and since I've been in Tacoma, I think between my engagement with Maxine Mims, Joy Hardiman, R.T. Young, Gilda Shepherd, uh, I've been told a number of times, you know that work that you're doing? That's Evergreen kind of work. <laughs> so I am thrilled. I want to close by doing something I thought about. And I'll tell you, uh, how I thought about it. I thought about sharing with you, if this computer would come on, uh, writing I've done for quite a while. It is my colleague, Grace Livingston, who described me as a radical communitarian. 
And I've embraced that mantra and I've only written about it. I've never spoken about it. So I'm going to just share with you just some excerpts from my thoughts of developing this notion of the radical communitarian. In the spirit of radical communitarianism, I engage in service and leadership within a vision of radical scholarship with communitarian objectives, which seeks to make knowledge available to publics outside the academy, which seeks to close the distance between the university and the surrounding community, which seeks to create nurturing centers of intellectual life that connect and engage persons inside and outside universities. A vision of radical scholarship with communitarian objectives seeks to make knowledge available to publics outside the academy, seeks to close the distance between the university and the sur surrounding community, seeks to create these nurturing centers, rejects the missionary messiah salvation model of engagement with the community, and instead embraces the risks, models with the community, and accepts the challenges and the rewards of full engagement with multiple communities and their multiple forms of knowledge beyond that which is strictly academic. Part of the fight that Grace Livingston and I engaged in for almost 20 years was to convince our community that we should be part of education that was at work beyond the traditional classrooms. And that the work that we did in community was education. It was not something else. It was not something in addition to education. It was education right at the heart of our liberal arts commitment. It was the strengthening of democracy. It was the creation of democratic citizens. It was challenging the barriers of divisions that separate our communities into those who have access and those who don't. Those who have privilege and those who don't. I do this work because every time I see someone left out, I see my mother. Oh. I know I'm way, <laughs> I'm way beyond, beyond my 13 minutes. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, wrap up, but here's where I want to end. I want to end with the goals of radical communitarian. One, end community marginalization. I have one person in church with me. End community marginalization. And I don't need to develop that for you because it's obvious that here we are on the land of the Puyallup Nation and we continue to marginalize them. Here we are in nations built by black people, and we continue to marginalize them. I won't, uh, if I start, <laughs> I'm gonna get 
into, into deeper choir business here. Two, end institutional academic isolation. I want to grow this choir. One, end community marginalization. Two, end institutional academic isolation. Three, create open, integrated, and engaged communities which value all forms of knowledge. Yes. One of the fights we engaged in, and Grace and I did this work, and, and my other colleagues here, one of the fights we engaged in was people telling us that what's this thing you're talking about, emotional knowledge? <laughs> There's no such thing, they told us in 2014. Get out of here with that. In fact, they, they, I like to tell my students, they did more than that. They said, emotional intelligence, emotions have no place in the academy. <laughs> so they thundered emotionally. <laughs> So, end community marginalization, end institutional academic isolation, create open, integrated, and engaged communities. And I'm ending with this one. Address historical social justice questions, which have their nexus in the connections and disconnections between schools, academies, and communities beyond them. If you've been to one of our colleges and universities, you've seen it. I taught for five years at the University of Alabama. The school sits here, and the black community sits over there. And when I took my students from the classroom, to the black community, they had no knowledge it existed. Mm. Absolutely no knowledge. When I came to the University of Puget Sound, it was oriented northward. And we had to say, there is a place called Sixth Avenue. And beyond it, the hilltop. Yes. I am, after all, standing in the Mibs Hardiman Temple, mm. right. right in the center of the hilltop. I am happy to join you, President Carmichael. I am a proud member of the team that will work with you to confront the challenges Evergreen face and chart a path to a bright future for this wonderful institution. Thank you, thank you so much. I think we got our uh, beautiful uh, introduction of Dr. Gordon and we also got our marching orders in one speech. <laughs> And indeed, they are important marching orders. You have come to the right place. We are excited to continue this work. And at this time, uh, I just want to thank you for those beautiful words and ask the final words to be from Professor Emeritus, the campus leader, Emeritus, um, Dr. Joy Hardiman. And before I bring her on, I should say that Dr. Mims has sent her congratulations as well. And at 93 years young, she was really trying to be here, but she did send her apologies and she is thrilled that you are here. Uh, but now I'd like to introduce to you one of my mentors, uh, someone who is responsible for picking up the baton and carrying on 
Evergreen State College Tacoma for a good 20 years in leadership. That's the reason why we are still here. And so without further ado, please welcome Dr. Joy Hart. Dr. Gordon, um, in the tradition of the church, <laughs> all right, um, when, 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 when a, when a uh, minister comes or a distinguished person comes, there's always a little call and response, mm -hmm. a little uh, amen. And oh, so, yeah. So I want to I wanna represent the visiting church. All right. Okay, or, or welcoming you to this church because this, this is a sacred space. And as a person who has been here a long time, I think it's really important to, to, to let you know you are not alone. You will not be alone because you are walking into space not just on the legacy of Dr. Shepard, Dr. Dr. Tate, myself, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Maxine Mims, Dr. R.T. Young, but you are walk, walk, coming into a place that embodies 6,000 years of, 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 of black excellence and black genius. All right. That this college that you're coming in here, which was modeled on the basis of the Temple Library Universities at Kimmet, if you look at those libraries, at those shrines, at those universities, they were anthropomorphic. So you walk in to the, to the womb, and that's our front door. And then you came into the heart, and you got your information. And then you went back into the classrooms, and you got your legs that you could walk on. All and right. you got your dialogue. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you could come to the stage and stand at the Holy of Holies and graduate. Right. That's the place you're at, and that's the place that will support you. That we built on, on the best practices of, 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 of traditional African education that was built on the concept of Mobutu. We are because mm -hmm. I am because we are. That was built on the concept of a circle of realizing things were not linear sequential, but things were cyclic. And what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. And so does life, death, and rebirth. And that's how we see our students. That's and that's the place that you're coming to. <laughs> coming to a place that was built on the best traditions of historical black colleges, both in terms of the rich value system, a place that's dedicated to reciprocity, inclusivity, civility, and hospitality, but a place that rests in the, in the legacy and the mandate of Mary McLeod Bethune when she made the model of her college, enter to learn mm -hmm. and to part to serve. That's right. And it is so appropriate that you talked about your mother so that you know that when you walk in here, you are fully protected because this place is also um, modeled by the Sankofa. And the Sankofa means not only go back and get your history, get that kind of knowledge you're talking about, but the other symbol of the Sankofa is a heart. And that symbol goes all the way back even to pre-dynastic Egypt. And it was the figure of the divine feminine. And so you were in a place where the divine feminine in the, in, 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 in the form of the ancestors and in the form of your dear mother is here to welcome you, to say welcome home, welcome home, welcome home. <laughs> To acknowledge Dr. Gordon's daughter is present, oh, Amara. Oh, lovely. Thank you for coming. See, we are family, so we needed to know that his daughter was present, and you are always welcome here. And by the way, even though Dr. Gordon is based in Olympia, he's asked for a key to Tacoma. Oh. And now I think. All has been said. Let us lift our, our glasses and toast to a gentleman, yes. Dr. Dexter Gordon. Yes. Cheers. Yes. 